We live in a society where few people don't know somebody who's been affected by separation or divorce. And an ever-increasing number of us have not only gone through the process, but experienced the pain and the problems associated with it. It is estimated that in excess of 240,000 children find themselves in this position every year. But how often do we realise that real people are behind every set of statistics and each one of them has a story to tell? These children can be from diverse backgrounds and experiences, but all have a right to know both parents. Our story is about Mark and Claire and their children Lisa and Tom. We will follow them through the process over about 18 months, hearing from those they met along the way. And one day he just left without any explanation. Then a year later, when he bothered to get back in contact, I had a new partner. But I did try to contact her about what was going to happen with Lisa and Tom but she never returned any, any of my calls. I wanted to see them as soon as possible and make up for lost time. I was trying to rebuild my life and I didn't need Mark coming back on the scene and unsettling the children. It wasn't that I wasn't capable of looking after them on my own. That's just nonsense. I know, I know I've come to terms with that a lot better now. It was the solicitor that first helped me see from the children's point of view. The thing is that the law looks at these disputes from the point of view of the children. How will it affect the children if they no longer are allowed to see their dad? But generally speaking, we assume that contact is a good thing for children. Contact with the absentee parent, usually the father, is a good thing for children and uh, the law will do what it can to ensure that contact takes place. Sometimes it's inconceivable that the mother will allow the children to go to the father's house, so we need to find a venue which is convenient and suitable for children and parents alike. And as I say, that's where contact centres have become an invaluable resource. The contact centres, there are supervised contact centres where there's a great deal of supervision, by the staff who are there, or there are observed or simply as supported contact centres where the facilities uh, are available, toys, rooms, confidentiality. Contact centres are intended to cover that very difficult period when contact is reintroduced following a relationship breakdown. And they have an enormous success rate, a, a fantastic success rate. Statistics, accurate statistics are not available, but anecdotally, it's rare that contact centre referrals fail if, the, if uh, they're embraced enthusiastically by both parents. I suppose I was angry and bitter, but I just wanted to see my, my kids. It's my right as a father, but it was the solicitor who told me about the rights that the kids had and how we could resolve the situation with the help of Kafkas. And I definitely wanted that to happen. We at CAFCAS get involved with families who may well be going through the court process within private law where parents are having some kind of a debate over where the children should make be living or what the contact arrangements are for those children. Within CAFCAS we ensure that we listen to what the children have to say and promote the children's rights and we always consider what is in the best interest of children and at the same time always take on board whether that child is safe and well within the environment they may well be living. One of the things that we try and do here is work with dispute resolution. What will happen when families go to court is that they will be asked by the court to come along to CAFCAS and speak to a practitioner. Initially we'll look to speak to both parents and identify any of the issues, possibly identify any safeguarding issues that may be and within that we also look to speak to the children about what the issues are around contact and where the children may live. Now one of the things that we can do from there is also use child contact centres and again this is about promoting the contact between children and their families quite often with non-resident parents and possibly extended family members. What we will do with child contact centres when we work closely with them is ensure that the children get to attend a centre where they can meet with, with non-resident parents and extended family members in a safe and friendly and controlled environment which hopefully then will give people involved the confidence to know that contact can work and is actually in the best interest of the children. I was beginning to understand how Lisa and Tom must be feeling. I'd seen them sad and worried but I had blamed Mark, but really it was them trying to cope with the breakup of their little family. It was coming clear that Mark and I needed to put our children's interests first. But when Mark first asked to see the kids, 
as in over my dead body. I was just trying to protect them. I think seeing the Kafkas officer got us both thinking. It was about putting the kids first and we were a lot more hopeful. It's not about winners or losers. It's about listening to the kids. So the CAFCAS officer suggests that we go to the Child Contact Centre. I never knew it existed. But it seemed like a good idea. Um, somewhere for neutral ground where there was nice things for the children to do and I knew they'd be safe. So, so that's what we put to the court. A parent who does not live with his or her child and who wishes to see the child and cannot reach an agreement about that with the parent with whom the child lives can make an application to the court for an order ordering that parent to allow contact. It is very important to remember two principles in relation to such applications. Firstly, it is the child who has a right to contact, not the parent. Secondly, following from that, and most importantly when making decisions about contact, the court always has the child's welfare as the paramount consideration. When an application for contact is issued, the parties will be referred to and seen by an officer of CAFCAS, which is the Independent Child and Family Advisory Service. If there has been some time elapsed since contact has occurred, or the resident parent has some concerns about the non-resident parent's ability to care for the child, that visits at a contact centre may be ordered. It is only in very unusual and rare cases that a court makes an order for there to be no contact at all. In some cases there may only be indirect contact by letters and cards, but in the vast majority of cases that come before the court, face-to-face -face contact, including overnight and holiday contact, occurs even if it takes some time to build it up. Contact centres have a vital role to play, especially in cases where a parent has to be reintroduced after a period of time and also in relation to cases involving very young children. I think what persuaded me to go to the contact centre is finding out the problems that can stack up in the children in the future if they are denied the contact with the other parent. When I first heard about the, the Child Contact Centre, I was very hesitant about it because I knew I could be trusted with the kids. But after me meeting the coordinator and the volunteers, I thought it was a really good idea. Child Contact Centres are child-centred, safe, impartial and confidential environments where children can see their non-resident parent and sometimes other family members. As it is important to know about a family before they arrive, the person referring them is asked to complete a referral form. The parents will also be asked to attend individual pre-contact visits. And finally, parents are encouraged to think about what their children might be feeling and what they can do to help them. Well, here at um, the contact centre in South Manchester, um, we have paid and voluntary staff that provide support. It's a very informal um, environment whereby parents are encouraged to interact with their children. We say supported because we are not bound legally um, and therefore don't have to write reports or take notes or pull parents up. So it's more informal in the sense that it's a more, we provide a more relaxed environment because parents aren't thinking about well, what they're going to say, how is this going to reflect on me in, in relation to a future court hearing too. So when they have their reservations and they have the concerns about, well, this doesn't feel like this is my relationship, it's all because everybody else has input, um, we kind of say, well, you know, that's what it is right now. But if you maintain the regularity of your visits, show that you have an interest in your relationship with your child, then it will progress to that stage. But we're here in the initial sense. The reason we, ha we encourage and we ask for a pre-contact visit is as much for the parents, for them to, so they don't get lost, they know where it is, they know what facility is available, if they've got any concerns they can raise it, you know, am I allowed to bring this, am I allowed to bring that, um, if they've got any issues they can query it beforehand. But what really helped me was 
going to the contact centre before the contract began. This let me see around the place and let the children feel settled in it. And then when they started to meet Mark, we got to meet the volunteers who ran the centre and they were really nice. And I didn't even have to see Mark at first. The role of a volunteer is quite varied from putting the information out for the parents, not only to read but the toys for the children to play with. And having done this, I then spend time looking after the children and the fathers and mothers in some cases to make sure that they are comfortable with the visit. We enjoy very much the time that we spend with them and we get a tremendous amount of joy and satisfaction from helping these children to have contact, positive contact, with their fathers. It's taken a long time, but we finally got there. I'm not saying it's been easy, but we've learned to put the kids first. Now I can be a real father, and that's never going to change. I never thought I'd be saying this, but Lisa and Tom are now seeing a dad every weekend away from the contact centre. Um, and they like it. No more than that, they really look forward to it. These are things that kids should really do with their dad. The majority of families use a child contact centre for between two and three months before moving on. We do not always know what happens, but many of them overcome their problems whilst they are at the centre and then make their own arrangements for contact. We know that the most important people at child contact centres are the children. It is important for everybody involved to focus upon them. Could you do this and, with training, help contribute to the running of a child contact centre? If so, you will join a lot of other people in making a real difference for not only the current generation of children affected by divorce and separation, but also those to come. Mm -hmm.